The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. We're talking about goodness of fit tests. Goodness of fit tests are is my, does my data come from a particular distribution? And why we would want to know this? Well, maybe we're interested in, for example, uh, you know, knowing if the uh, zodiac signs of the Fortune 500 CEOs are uniformly distributed, or maybe we actually have slightly more, uh, slightly deeper uh, endeavors, uh, such as understanding if you can actually apply the t-test by testing normality of your sample. All right, so we saw that there's the main result is the main standard test for this is called the Kolmogorov Smirnov test that people uh, use quite a bit. It's probably one of the most used tests out there. And uh, there's other uh, versions of it uh, that I mentioned passing by. There's the Kramer von Mises and there's the Anderson Darling test. Now, how would you pick one of such tests? Well, you know, they're always are going to have they're always going to have their advantages and disadvantages. And uh, Kolmogorov Smirnov is definitely the most uh, uh, widely used because, well, I guess because it's a natural notion of distance between functions. You just look for each point how far they can be, and you just look at the farthest they can be everywhere. Now, you know, Kravar von Mises involves L2 distance, so if you're not used to, you know, Hilbert spaces or uh, uh, notions of, you know, Euclidean spaces, at least it's a little more complicated. And then Anderson Dowling is definitely even more complicated. Now, each of these tests is going to be more powerful against other alternatives. So, unless you can really guess which alternative you're expecting to see, which you probably don't, because again, in, you're in a case where you want to typically de de declare H0 to be the correct one, then it's really, you know, a matter of tossing a coin. Um, maybe you can run all three of them and just sleep better at night because all three of them have failed to reject, for example. All right, so as I mentioned, one of the maybe primary goals to test uh, goodness of fit is to, t is to be able to check whether we can apply students' uh, test, right? And if the student distribution is actually a valid distribution, and for that we need to have normally distributed data. Now, as I said several times, normally distributed is not a specific distribution. It's a family of distribution that's indexed by means and variances. And the way I would want to test if a distribution is normally distributed is, well, I would just look at the most natural normal distribution or Gaussian distribution that my data could follow. That means that's the Gaussian distribution that has the same mean as my data and the same empirical variance as my data, all right? And so I'm going to be given some points at x1, xn. And I'm going to be asking, are those Gaussian? That means this is equivalent to say, are they n? mu sigma square or sum mu sigma squared. And of course, the natural choice is to take mu hat to be uh, mu to be equal to mu hat, which is xn bar, and sigma squared to be sigma squared hat to be, uh, uh, um, well, uh, sn hat, sn, what we wrote sn, which is 1 over n, sum from i equal 1 to n of xi minus xn bar squared, okay? So this is definitely the natural one you would want to test, and maybe you could actually just close your eyes and just stuff that in a, uh, a, uh, a kolmogorov smirnov test. Okay, so here, there's a few things that don't work. The first one is that the Donsker's theorem does not work anymore, right? Donsker's theorem was the one that told us that, you know, properly normalized, this thing would actually convert to the supremum of a Brownian bridge, which is not true. So that's one problem. But there's actually an even bigger problem is that this distribution we will check in a second actually does not, is pivotal itself, right? This, this, this statistic is pivotal. It does not have a distribution that depends on unknown parameters, which is sort of nice, at least under the null. However, the distribution is not the same as the one that had fix mu and sigma. The fact that they come from some random variables uh, is actually distorting the distribution itself, and in particular, the quantiles are going to be distorted, and we hinted at that last time. So one of the things I need to tell you, though, is that this thing actually, uh, so I know there's uh, some, there's, oh yeah, that's where, uh, that's where uh, there's a word missing, so we compute the quantiles for this test statistic. And so what I need to promise to you is that these quantiles 
do not depend on any unknown parameter, right? I mean, it's not clear. This, uh, uh, um, right, so I want to test whether my data has some Gaussian distribution, so under the null, all I know is that my, my xi's are Gaussian with some mean mu and some variance sigma, which I don't know, so it could be the case that when I try to understand the distribution of this quantity under the null, it depends on mu and sigma, which I don't know. So we need to check that this is the case. And what's actually our uh, 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 redemption here is actually going to be the um, uh, supremum. The supremum is going to basically allow us to, say, soup out mu and, and, and sigma squared. So let's check that, right? So what I'm interested in is this quantity, supremum over t in R, of the difference between fn of t and uh, what I write phi mu hat sigma squared of t. So phi mu hat sigma hat squared, sorry, sigma hat squared is the CDF of some Gaussian with mean mu hat and variant sigma hat squared. And so in particular, this thing here, phi hat of mu hat, uh, sorry, phi hat of mu hat sigma hat squared of t is the probability that some x is less than t where x follows some n mu hat sigma hat squared. So what it means is that by just the translation and scaling trick that we typically do for Gaussian to turn it into some standard Gaussian, that implies that there exists some z, which is standard Gaussian this time, so mean zero and variance one, such that x is equal to sigma hat x sorry, uh, z plus mu hat, agreed? That's, that's basically saying that x has some uh, uh, Gaussian with mean mu and variance sigma squared. And I'm not gonna say the hats every single time, okay? So, okay, so that's what it means. So in particular, uh, maybe I shouldn't use uh, x here because x is gonna be my actual data. So let me write uh, y. Okay, so now what is the what is this guy here? It's basically uh, so phi hat. So this implies that phi mu hat sigma hat squared of t is equal to the probability that sigma hat z plus mu hat is less than t, which is equal to the probability that z is less than t minus mu hat divided by sigma hat. Right? But now when z is a standard normal, this is really just the cumulative distribution function of a standard Gaussian, but evaluated at a point which is not t, but t minus mu hat divided by sigma hat. All right, so in particular, what I know, so from this, what I get, well, maybe I'll remove that, it's gonna be annoying. I know that phi mu hat sigma hat squared, sorry, phi mu hat sigma hat squared of t is simply phi of say zero, one, and that's just a notation, usually we don't put those, but uh, here it's more convenient, so it's phi zero, one of t minus mu hat divided by sigma hat, okay? That's just something you can quickly check. Uh, there's this nice way of writing the cumulative distribution function for any mean and any uh, variance in terms of the cumulative distribution function uh, with mean zero and variance one. All right, not too complicated. All right, so now what I'm gonna say is that, okay, I have this soup here, so what I can write is that this thing here is equal to the soup over t in R of one over n, let me write what fn is, sum from i equal one to n of the indicator that xi is less than t minus phi zero one of t minus mu hat divided by sigma hat. Okay, I actually want to make a change of variable so that this thing I'm gonna call mu, a uh, u, sorry. Okay, and so I'm gonna make my life easier and I'm gonna make it appear here. And so I'm just gonna replace this by indicator that xi minus mu hat divided by sigma hat less than t minus mu hat divided by sigma hat. 
which is sort of useless at this point. I'm just making my formula more complicated. But now I see something here that shows up, and I will call it u. And this is another u. OK? So now what it means is that souping over t, when t ranges from negative infinity to plus infinity, then u ranges from negative infinity to plus infinity, right? So this soup, I can actually write, this soup in t, I can write as a soup in u. So it's indicator that xi minus mu hat divided by sigma hat is less than u minus phi 0, 1 of u. Now let's pause for one second. Let's see where we're going. Well, we're trying to show that this thing does not depend on the unknown parameters, say mu and sigma, which are the mean and the variance of x under the null. To do that, we basically need to make only quantities that are sort of invariant under these values. So I try to make this thing invariant under anything. It's just really something that depends on nothing. It's the CDF. It doesn't depend on sigma hat and mu hat anymore. But sigma hat and mu hat will depend on mu and sigma, right? I mean, they're actually good estimators of those guys, so they should be pretty close to them. And so I need to make sure that I'm not actually doing anything wrong here. So the key thing here is going to be to observe that 1 over n sum from i equal 1 to n of indicator of xi minus mu hat divided by sigma hat less than u, which is the first term that I have in this uh, absolute value, well, this is what? Well, this is uh, equal to 1 over n, sum from i equal 1 to n, of indicator that, well, now under the null, which is that x follows n mu sigma squared for some mu and sigma squared that are unknown, but they are here, they exist, I just don't know what they are, then xi minus mu can be written as sigma zi plus mu minus mu hat divided by sigma hat, where z is equal to x minus mu divided by sigma, right? That's just the same trick uh, that I wrote here. OK? Everybody agrees? I just standardize, uh, sorry, z, yeah. So zi is xi minus mu i minus mu divided by sigma. All right, just the standardization. So now once I write this, I can actually divide everybody by sigma. Right, I just divided on top here and at the bottom here. So now what I need to check is that the distribution of this guy does not depend on mu or sigma. That's what I claim. What is the distribution of this indicator? It's a Bernoulli, right? And so if I want to understand its distribution, all I need to do is to compute its expectation, which is just the probability that this thing happens. But the probability that this thing happens is actually not depending on mu and sigma. And the reason is that mu is what? Well, it's x bar. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So mu hat, sorry, is x n bar. So mu hat minus mu, which under the null follows n mu sigma square over n, right? That's the property of the average. So when I do mu hat minus mu divided by sigma, this thing has what distribution? It's still a normal. It's a linear transformation of a normal. What are the parameters? Zero, one over n. Yeah, 0, 1 over n. But this does not depend on mu or sigma, right? Now, I need to check that this guy does not depend on mu or sigma. What is the distribution of sigma hat minus si over sigma? Yeah, it is a chi-square. So this is actually. Sorry, sigma hat squared divided by sigma squared is a chi squared with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. 
does not depend on mu or sigma. Uh, yeah, thank you. So this is actually divided by n. So maybe this guy. Let's write it like that. This is the proper way of writing it. Thank you. Right? So now I have those two things. Neither of them depends on mu or sigma. I have those two, those two things. There's just one more thing to check. What is it? that they're independent, right? Because the dependence in mu and sigma could be hidden in the covariance. It could be the case that the marginal distribution of mu does not depend on mu or sigma. That the marginal distribution of sigma, of, of mu hat does not depend on mu and sigma. The marginal distribution of sigma hat does not depend on mu or sigma, but their correlation could depend on mu and sigma. But we also have that if I look at, uh, the, so if I look at, uh, uh, um, so since, mu hat is independent of sigma hat, it means that the joint distribution of mu hat divided by sigma n sigma hat divided by sigma does not depend on blah, 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 on mu and sigma, okay? Agreed? It's not in the individual ones and it's not in their, the way they interact with each other. It's nowhere. Yeah, coherence theorem, right? So that's something we've been using over and again. That's all under the null. If my data is not Gaussian, nothing, of the, nothing actually holds. I just use the fact that under the null, I'm Gaussian for some mean mu and variance sigma squared. But that's all I care about. When I'm designing a test, I only care about the, dis the distribution under the null, at least to control the type one error, uh, then to control the type two error, uh, then you know, I cross my fingers pretty hard. Okay, so um, now this basically implies what's written on the board, that this distribution, this uh, uh, test statistic does not depend on any unknown parameters. It's just something that's pivotal. In particular, I could go at the back of a book and check if there's a table for the quintiles of these things, and indeed there are. This is uh, uh, the table that you see so actually, this is not even in a book. This is in uh, Lady Force uh, Originals uh, paper, uh, 1967, as you can tell from the typewriting. And, uh, and uh, you know, he actually, you know, probably was rolling some dice from his office back in the day and uh, was checking that this was, uh, you know, he simulated and this is how he computed those numbers. And here, you also have some lim limiting distribution, which is not the soup of a brown motion over zero one, uh, 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 sorry, of a brown bridge over zero one, which is the one that you would see for the uh, Kolmogorov Smirnov test, but it's something that's slightly different. And uh, as I said, these numbers are actually typically much smaller than the numbers you would get, right? Remember, we got something that was about 0 0.5, I think, or maybe 0 0.41 for the uh, Kolmogorov Smirnov test at the same entrance, which means that using Kolmogorov Lilith Force tests is going to be harder for you not to reject. With the same data, it might be the case that in one case you reject and in the other one you fail to reject, but the ordering is always that if you fail to reject with Kolmogorov Lilith Force, you will fail to reject uh, with Kolmogorov Smirnov. Right? There's uh, always one. So that's why people tend to close their eyes and prefer uh, Kolmogorov Smirnov because it just makes their life easier. Okay, so uh, this is called Kolmogorov Lilly Force. I think there's actually an E here. Uh, sorry, an I uh, before the E. Uh, doesn't matter too much. Okay, are there any questions? Yes.
Yeah. So, so the fact that it's actually a different distribution is that um, here, so if I actually knew what mu and sigma were, I would do exactly the same thing. But here, rather than having this average with mu and sigma, I would just have the average uh, with mu hat and sigma hat. I would just have the average with mu and sigma. Okay. So what it means is that the key thing is that what I would compare is the one over n sum of some Bernoulli's with parameter, and the parameter here would be the probability that mu uh, x i minus mu over sigma is less than u, which is just uh, the probability that phi, uh, sorry. It's a Bernoulli with probability uh, f of t. Uh, well, let me write that what it is. Right, so that's uh, minus uh, phi 0, 1 of t. Okay, so that's for the ks test. And then I soup over t, right? That's what I would have had because this is actually exactly the right thing. Here I would remove the true mean. I would divide by the true standard deviation, so that would actually end up being a standard Gaussian, and that's why I'm allowed to use phi zero one here. Agreed? And these are Bernoulli's because they're just indicators. What happens in the uh, komogorov lili force test? Well, here the Bernoulli. The only thing that's going to change is this guy, right? They still have a Bernoulli. It's just that the parameters of the Bernoulli are weird. The, pr the parameters of the Bernoulli looks like it's uh, it becomes the probability that some uh, n01 plus some uh, n01 over n right divided by some uh, square root of k squared n minus 1 divided by n is less than t and uh, those things are independent, but those guys are not necessarily independent, right? And so wh why is this probability changing? Well, because this denominator is actually fluctuating a lot, so that actually makes this probability different. And so that's basically where it comes from, right? So you could probably convince yourself very quickly that uh, this only makes those guys closer and uh, why does it make those guys closer? No, sorry, it makes those guys farther, right? And it makes those guys farther for a very clear reason is that this, the expectation of this Bernoulli is exactly that guy. Here it's, all, I think it's gonna be true as well that the expectation of this Bernoulli is gonna be that guy, but the fluctuations are gonna be much bigger than just if I had the Bernoulli because the first thing I do is I have a random parameter for my Bernoulli and then I flip the Bernoulli. So the fluctuations are gonna be bigger than a Bernoulli and so when I take the soup, I'm gonna have to pay them. So it makes things farther apart, which makes it more likely for you to reject. Yeah. It means that Lily force is harder not to reject, yes. Because we reject when we're larger than the number. So the number being smaller, we're m with the same data we might be, right? So basically it looks like this. Uh, what we run, so here we have the distribution for the, uh, so let's say this is the density for uh, Ks. And then we have the density for uh, L, uh, Kolmogorov Lili force, KL, okay? And what the density of KL looks like, it looks like this. Right? And so if I want to squeeze in alpha here, I'm gonna have to squeeze in, um, and I squeeze in alpha here then this is the quantile of order one minus alpha, well, let's say alpha of the KL, and this is the quantile alpha of KS. So now you give me data, and what I do is that I check whether they're larger than this number. So if I apply KS, I check whether I'm larger or smaller than this thing, but if I apply Kolmogorov linear force, I check whether I'm larger or smaller than this thing. So with this entire range of values for my test statistic, because it is the same test statistic, 
I just plugged in mu hat and sigma hat for this entire range, the two tests have different outcome. And this is a big range in practice, right? I mean, it's between, it's, 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 I mean, it's pretty much on, on, at scale here. Okay. Any, any other, yeah. Mm. Yeah, they should become the same uh, very far. Um, let me see though, because right. So here we have eight. Uh, so here we have say for uh, point five we get point eight eight six, and for oh I don't have it. Yeah, actually, sorry. So you're right. You're totally right. This is the Brown and Bridge uh, values. Because in the limit, by C, Slutsky, uh, sorry, uh, I'm lost. Yeah, these are the values that you get for the Brown and Bridge because in the limit by Slutsky, this thing is gonna have no fluctuation and this thing is gonna have no fluctuation. So they're just gonna be pinned down and it's gonna look like as if I did not replace anything because in the limit, I know those guys much faster, the mu hat and sigma hat converge much faster to mu and sigma than uh, the distribution itself, All right? So those are actually gonna be negligible, you're right. Actually even, I didn't have, I, these are actually the numbers I showed you for the bridge, the brown bridge last time because I didn't have it for the uh, Komogorov Smirnoff one. Okay. So there's actually, so those are numerical ways of checking things, right? I give you data, you just Crunk the Komogorov Smirnov test. Usually you press F5 on MATLAB, but uh, uh, let's say you actually compute this entire thing and uh, there's a number that comes out and uh, you decide whether it's large enough or small enough. Of course, statistical software is gonna make your life even simpler by spitting out a p-value because you can, I mean, if you can compute quintiles, you can also qu compute p-values. And so, you know, your life is just fairly easy. You just have, you know, red is uh, bad, green is good, and uh, then you can go. The problem is that uh, those are numbers you want to rely on, but let's say you actually reject. Let's say you reject your p-value is actually just like slightly below 5%. So you can say, well, maybe I'm just gonna change my, uh, my, uh, uh, my p-value, my threshold to 1%, but you might wanna see what's happening. And for that, you need a visual diagnostics. Like how do I check if something departs from being normal, for example? How do I check if a distribution why is a distribution not a uniform distribution? Why is a distribution not an exponential distribution? There's many ways, right? If I have a, an exponential distribution and I first, first half of my values are negative, for example, well, there's like pretty obvious reasons why it should not be exponential. But it could be the case that it's just the tails are a little heavier or the, uh, there's more concentration at some point, maybe it has two modes, there's things like this. But the real thing, we don't believe that the Gaussian is so important because it looks like this, close to zero. What we like about the Gaussian is that the tails here decay at this rate exponential minus x squared over two that we described in the maybe first lecture. And in particular, if there were like kinks around here, it wouldn't matter too much. This is not what makes issues for the Gaussian. And so what we want is to have a visual diagnostic that tells us if the tails of my distribution are comparable to the tails of a Gaussian one, for example. And those are uh, uh, what's called quintile-quintile plots, and in, in particular, or QQ plots. And the, very sp the, the, the basic QQ plots we're gonna be using are the ones that are called normal QQ plots that are comparing your data to a Gaussian distribution or a normal distribution. But in general, you could be comparing your data to any distribution you want. And the way you do this is by comparing the quintiles of your data, the empirical quintiles, to the quintiles of the actual distribution you're trying to compare yourself to. So this, in a way, is a visual way of performing this goodness of fit test. And what's nice about visual is that there's room for debate. You can see something that somebody else cannot see, and you can always, because you want to say that things are Gaussian, and we'll see some examples where you can actually see it if you are you know, good at debate. Uh, but uh, it's actually gonna be clearly not true. All right, so this is a quick and easy check. That's something I do all the time. You give me data, I'm just gonna run this one of the first thing I do so I can check if I can start, you know, entering the Gaussian world without, you know, compromising myself too much. 
And um, the idea is to say, well, if f is close to, if, f, if my data comes from uh, f, and if I know that fn is close to f, then rather than computing some norm, some number that tells me how far they are, summarizing how far they are, I could actually plot the two functions and see if they're far apart. So let's, let's think for one second what uh, uh, this kind of, uh, of plot would look like. Well, I would go between 0 and 1. That's where everything would happen. Let's say my distribution is the Gaussian distribution. So this is the CDF of n01. And now I have this guy that shows up. And remember, we had this piecewise constant. Um, well, OK, let's say we get something like this. We get a piecewise constant um, uh, distribution for, uh, for Fn, right? Just from this, and even despite my bad skills at drawing, it's clear that it's going to be hard for you to distinguish those two things, even for a fairly large amount of points, because the problem is going to happen here, and those guys look pretty much the same everywhere you are here. You're going to see differences maybe in the middle, but we don't care too much about those differences. And so what's going to happen is that you're going to want to compare those two things, and this is basically you have the information you want, but visually it just doesn't render very well because you're not scaling things properly. And the way we actually do it is by flipping things around. And rather than comparing the plot of f to the plot of fn, we compare the plot of fn inverse to the plot of f inverse. Now, if f goes from the real line to the interval 0, 1, f inverse goes, through, goes from uh, 0, 1 to the whole real line. So what's going to happen is that I'm going to compare things on some intervals, which, is the which are the entire real line. And then what values should I be looking those things at? Well, technically for f, if f is continuous, I could look at, at f inverse for any value that I please, right? So I have f. And if I want to look at f inverse, I pick a point here, and I look at the value that it gives me, and that's f inverse of, say, u, right, if this is u. And I could pick any value I want. I'm going to be able to find it. The problem is that when I start to have this piecewise constant thing, I need to decide what value I assign for anything that's in between two jumps, right? And so I can choose whatever I want, but in practice, it's just going to be things that I myself decide. Maybe I can decide that this is the value. Maybe I can decide that the value is here. But for all these guys, I'm going to pretty much decide always the same value, right? If I'm in between for this value u, for this jump, uh, the jump is here. So if uh, for, for this value, I'm going to be able to decide whether I want to go above or below, but it's always this value that's going to come out. So rather than picking values that are in between, I might as well just pick only values for which this is the value that it's going to get. And those values are exactly 1 over n, 2 over n, 3 over n, 4 over n. It's all the way to n over n. Right? That's exactly where the flat parts are. We know we jump from 1 over n every time. And so that's exactly the recipe. It says, look at those values, 1 over n, 2 over n, 3 over n, until, say, n minus 1 over n. And for those values, compute the inverse of both the empirical CDF and the true CDF. Now, for the empirical CDF, it's actually easy. I just told you this is basically where the, points occur, where the jumps occur. And the jumps occur where? Well, exactly at my observations. Now, remember, I need to sort those observations to, to talk about them. So the one that occurs for the ith jump is the ith largest observation, which we denoted by ad x sub parenthesis i. Remember, we had this formula that we said, well, we have x1, xn. These are my data. And what I'm going to sort them into is x sub 1 parenthesis, which is less than or equal to x sub 2 parenthesis, which is less than x sub n parenthesis. Okay, so we just ordered them from smallest to largest, and to know that we've done that, we just put this parenthesis notation. So in particular, f n inverse of i over n is the location where the ith jumps occur, which is the ith largest observation. Okay. So for this guy, this values the y-axis are actually fairly easy. I know it's basically my ordered observations. The x values are 
Well, that depends on the function f I'm trying to test. If it's the Gaussian, it's just the quintile of order 1 minus 1 over n, right? It's this q1 minus 1 over n here that I need to compute. It's the inverse of the cumulative distribution function, which given the formula for f, you can actually compute or maybe estimate fairly well, but it's something that you can find in tables. Those are basically quintiles. Inverse of CDFs are quintiles, right? And so that's basically uh, uh, the things we're interested in. That's why it's called quintile quintile. Those are the some refer, sometimes referred to as theoretical quintiles, the one we're trying to test, and empirical quintiles, the one that corresponds with the empirical CDF. And so I'm plotting a plot where the x-axis is quintile, the y-axis is quintile, and so I call this plot a quintile quintile plot, or qq plot. Because, well, just say 10 times quintile quintile, and then you'll see why. Yeah? Well, that's just that we're back to the uh, we're back to the uh, uh, goodness of fit test, right? So, if you look, so you don't do it yourself. That's the simple answer to it. You don't. I just I'm just telling you how those plots that you're going to be seen spit out from a software are going to look like. Now, depending on the software, there's a different thing that's happening. Some softwares are actually plotting f with the right. Uh, let's say you want to do quant uh, normal, as you asked. So, you some software are just going to use f to be with mu hat and sigma hat. And that's fine. Some software are actually not going to do this. They're just going to use a Gaussian. But then they're going to actually have a different uh, reference point. So what do we want to see here? What should happen if all these points, if all my points actually come from f, from a distribution that has CDF f? What should happen? What should I see? Well, since fn should be close to f, fn inverse should be close to f inverse, which means that this point should be close to that point. This point should be close to that point. So ideally, if I actually pick the right f, I should see a plot that looks like this. Something where all my points are very close to the line y is equal to x, right? And I'm going to have some fluctuations, but something very close to this. Now, that's if f is exactly the right one. If f is not exactly the right one, in particular in the case of a uh, Gaussian one, if I actually plotted here the quintiles, so if I plotted f, f0, 1 of t, Right? So let's say those are the ones I actually plot, but I really don't know what mu hat is not zero and sigma hat is not zero. And so this is not the one I should be getting. Since we actually know that phi of mu hat sigma hat squared t is equal to phi zero one of t minus mu hat divided by sigma hat, there's just this change of axis, which is actually very simple. This change of axis is just a simple translation scaling, which means that this, this line here is going to be transformed into another line with a different slope and a different intercept. And so some software will actually decide to go with this curve and just show you what the reference curve should be, rather than actually putting everything back onto the 45-degree uh, curve. So you get any straight line? Any straight line, you're happy. I mean, depending on the software. Because if the software actually really rescaled this thing to have mu hat and sigma square and you find a different line, then you're a, a different straight line, this is bad news, which is not going to happen, actually. It's impossible that it happens. Because you've actually said, well, no, it could. If, you're, if it's crazy, it could. It, it, it should be very crazy. OK, so let's see what uh, R does for us, for example. So here. In R, uh, R actually does this uh, funny trick where, so here I did not actually plot the lines. I should actually add the line. So the command is like QQ norm of my sample, right? And that's really simple. I just stack all my data into some vector, say X, and I say QQ norm of X, and uh, it just spits this thing out, okay? Very simple. But I could actually add another command, which I can't remember. I think it's like uh, QQ line. And it's just going to add the line on top of it. But if you see actually what R does for us, it's actually 
doing the translation and scaling on the axes themselves. So it actually changes the uh, X and Y axis in such a way that when you look at your picture and you forget about what the meaning of the axes are, the relevant straight line is actually still the 45 degree line. It's because it's actually done the change of, uh, of units for you. So you don't have to even see the line. You know that in your mind that this is basically the reference line is still 45 degree uh, because that's the way the, the axes are made. But if I actually put my axes, right? So here, for example, it goes from, uh, let's look at some, uh, well, okay, those are all square. Um, yeah, and that's probably because I actually have, a, the samples are actually from a standard normal. So uh, I did not make my life very easy to illustrate your question, but of course I didn't know you were gonna ask it. Next time, let's just prepare. Uh, let's script some more. Uh, we'll see in another one in the next plot. But so here, what you expect to see is that all the plots should be on the 45 degree line, right? This is, there should be the right one. And if you see, when I start having 10,000 samples, this is exactly what's happening. So this is good, as good as it gets. This is an N01 plotted against the theoretical quantile of an N01. As good as it gets. Now if you see for the second one, which is 50, sample, size of size, sample of size 50, there is some fudge factor, right? I mean, those things are, doesn't look like there's a straight line, right? It sort of appears that there's some weird things happening here at the lower tail. And the reason why this is happening is because we're trying to compare the tails, right? When I look at this picture, the only thing that goes wrong somehow is always at the tip because those are sort of rare and extreme values and they're sort of all over the place. And so things are never really super smooth and super clean. So this is what your best shot is. This is what you ever, will ever hope to get. So size 10, right? So you have 10 points. Remember, we actually, well, I didn't really tell you how to deal with the extreme cases because the problem is that F inverse of one for the true F is plus infinity. So you have to make some sort of weird boundary choices to decide what F inverse of one is. And it's something that's like somewhere. But you still want to put like 10 dots, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10 dots. So I have 10 observations, you will see 10 dots. I have 50 observations, you will see 50 dots. Remember, right? Because I have, th there are one over n, two over n, three over n, all the way to n over n. I didn't tell you the last one. Okay, so this is when things go well, and this is when things should not go well. Okay, so here actually the distribution is a student t with 15 degrees of freedom which should depart somewhat from a Gaussian distribution, the tails should be heavier. And what you can see is basically the following, is that uh, for 10, you actually see something that's crazy, right? If I do 10 observations, but if I do 50 observations, honestly, it's kind of hard to say that it's different from the standard normal. So you could still be happy with this for 100, and then this is what's happening for 10,000. And even here, it's not the beautiful straight line, but it feels like you would be still tempted to conclude that it's a beautiful straight line. So let's try to guess. So basically, there's, for each of those sides, there's two phenomena. Either it goes like this, or it goes like this, and then it goes like this, or goes like this. Each side corresponds to the left tail, this, all the smallest values. So that's the left side, and that's the right side corresponds to the large values. Okay, and so basically you can actually think of, um, some sort of a table that tells you what your QQ plot looks like. And so let's say it looks like, so we have our reference 45 degree line. So let's say this is the QQ plot. That's, that could be one thing. This could be the QQ plot where I have another thing. That's, uh, then I can do um, this guy. And then I do this guy. Uh, so this is uh, like this, okay? Those are the four cases, okay? And here, what's changing is the right tail, and here what's changing is the, and when I go from here to here, what changes is the left tail. Uh, is that true? No, sorry, what changes here is the right tail. Right, that's this part that changes from uh, uh, top to bottom. So here it's something about right tail. And here, that's something about left tail. <coughs> Everybody understands what I mean when I talk about tails? Okay. And so here is just gonna be a question of whether the tails are heavier or lighter than the Gaussian. 
Everybody understand what I mean when I say heavy tails and light tails? Okay. So, right, so heavy tails just means that uh, basically here, the tails of this guy are heavier than the tails of this guy. So it means that if I draw them, they're gonna be above. Actually, let me keep this picture because it's gonna be very useful for me. When I plot the quintiles at the same, so let's look at the right tail, for example, right here, my picture is for right tails. When I look at the quintiles of my theoretical distribution, so here you can see the bottom curve, we have the theoretical quintiles, and those are the empirical quintiles. This, if I look to the right here, are the theoretical quintiles larger or smaller than the empirical quintiles? Let me phrase it the other. Are the empirical quintiles larger or smaller than the theoretical quintiles? It should be smaller, right? On this line, they are equal. So if I see the empirical quantile showing up here, it means that here, the empirical quantile is less than the theoretical quantile. Agree? So that means that if I look at this thing, and that's for the same values, right? So the quantiles are computed for the same values, i over n. So it means that the empirical quantile should be looking, uh, so that should be the empirical quantile. And that should be the theoretical quintile. Agreed? Those are the smaller values for the same alpha. So that implies that the tails, the right tail, is it heavy or lighter, heavier or lighter than the Gaussian? Yeah, lighter, right? Because those are the tails of the Gaussian. Those are my theoretical quintiles. That means that this is the tail of my, of my empirical distribution. So they are actually lighter. Okay? So here, if I look at this thing, this means that the right tail is actually light. And by light, I mean lighter than Gaussian. Heavy, I mean heavier than Gaussian. Okay? Okay, now we can probably do the entire thing. Well, if this is light, <laughs> this is gonna be heavy, right? That's when I'm above the curve. Exercise, is this light or is this heavy? The first column. It's okay, it should take you at least 30 seconds. Yeah, this column, right? So this is something that pertains, this entire column is gonna tell me whether the fact that this guy is above, does this mean that I have lighter or heavier uh, left tails? On the left, it's heavier. Okay, so I, I don't know, actually, I need to draw a picture. You guys are probably faster than I am. <laughs> Actually, let me check how much randomness is in. Who says it's lighter? Who says it's heavier? <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, all right, so let's see if it's heavier. So we're on the left tail. And so we have one looks like this, one looks like that, right? So we know here that I'm looking at this part here. So it means that here my empirical quintile is larger than the theoretical quintile. Okay? So are my tails heavier or lighter? They're lighter. That was a bad bias. <laughs> right? It's below, so it's lighter. As the problem is that larger for the negative ones means <laughs> that it's smaller uh, in absolute, right? Yeah. Sorry, but what exactly are you processing? Is it, is it just two inverse, uh, two inverse DDS since everything, well, you need an inverse DDS and you could only be inputting values between zero and one. And oh, did I put this inverse CDF? No, the inverse CDN, yeah, so I'm, I'm inputting. Oh, you're saying. Yeah, so it's a scatter plot, right? So each point 
is attached, each point is attached 1 over n, 2 over n, 3 over n. Now for each point I'm plotting, that's my x value, which maps a number between 0 and 1 back onto the entire real line, and my y value is the same. Okay, so what it means is that those two numbers, this, is in the this lives on the entire real line, not on the interval. This lives on the entire real line, not in the interval. And so my QQ plots take values on the entire real line, entire real line. Right, so it's, you think of it as a parameterized curve where the, the time steps are one over n, two over n, three over n, and I'm just like putting a dot every time I'm making one step. Okay. Okay, so what did we say? <laughs> that was lighter, right? Okay. One of my favorite exercises is, here's a bunch of densities. Here's a bunch of QQ plots. Map the correct QQ plot to its own density, all right? And, uh, and there won't be uh, mingled lines that allow you to do that, then you just have to follow, like at the, ba the back of serial boxes. All right, um, are there any questions? So one thing, there's two things I'm trying to communicate here is, if you see a QQ plot, now you should understand, one, how it was built, and two, uh, whether it means that you have heavier tails or lighter tails. Now let's look at this guy. What should we see? We should see heavy on the left and heavy on the right, right? We know that this should be the case. So this thing actually looks like this. And it sort of does, right? If I take this line going through here, I can see that this guy is tipping here and this guy is dipping here. But honestly, actually, I can't remember exactly, but T15, if I plotted the density on top of the Gaussian, you can see a difference, but if I just give it to you, it would be very hard for you to tell me if there's an actual difference between T15 and Gaussian, right? Those things are actually very close. And so in particular here, we're really trying to recognize what the shape is, the fact, right? So T15 compared to a standard Gaussian was dif different, but T15 compared to a Gaussian with slightly larger variance is not gonna actually, see, you're not gonna see much of a difference. So in a way, you know, such distributions are actually not too far from the Gaussian, and it's not too, it's still pretty benign to conclude that this was actually a Gaussian distribution, because you can just, you know, use the variance at a little bit of a buffer. I'm not gonna go really into how you would use a T distribution into a T test, because it's kind of like, it's inception. All right, so, uh, but you could pretend that your data actually is, uh, is uh, t-distributed and then build a t-distribution from it. But uh, let's not say that. Uh, maybe that, that was a bad example. But, you know, there's like other heavy tail distributions like Cauchy distribution, which doesn't even have a, it's not even integrable. So that's as heavy as the tails get. And uh, this, you can really tell, is gonna look like this. It's gonna be like, what does a uniform distribution look like? <laughs> like this? It's gonna be. A, it's gonna look like a Gaussian one, right? So, right. So a uniform. Dis so this is my Gaussian. A uniform is basically gonna look like this once I take the right mean and the right variance, right? So the tails are definitely lighter. They're zero. That's as lighter as it gets. So the light light is gonna look like this S shape. So an S light tail distribution has this S shape. Okay, uh, what is the um, exponential gonna look like? Right, so the exponential is positively supported. It only has positive numbers. So there's no left tail. This is also as, li as light as it gets, but the right tail, is it heavier or lighter than the Gaussian? It's heavier, right? It's only decays like e to the minus x rather than e to the minus x squared. So it's heavier. So it means that on the left it's gonna be light, and on the right it's gonna be heavy. So it's gonna be U-shaped, okay? That'll be fun. All right, any other question? Again, two messages, like more technical, and you can sort of fiddle with it by looking at it, you can definitely conclude that this is okay enough to be Gaussian for your purpose. Yeah. So like the one where you have the, 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 the
I did not hear the if at the beginning of your sentence. <laughs> So what is your purpose as a Yes. So if it belongs to make it easier to reject or it's not. Then yeah, in a way that's true, right? So once you've actually factored in the mean and the variance, yeah. the only thing that actually right so if you have Gaussian tails or lighter, even lighter tails, then it's harder for you to explain deviations from randomness only, right? If you have a uniform distribution and you see something which is, if you're uniform on zero, one plus some number and you see 25, you know this number is not gonna be zero, right? So that's basically as good as it gets and it's, there's basically some smooth interpolation if you have lighter tails. Now if you start having something that has heavy tails, then it's more likely that pure noise will generate large observations and therefore discovery. So yes, lighter tails is definitely the be better behaved noise, let's put it this way. The lighter it is, the better behaved it is. Now, for this is good in a, this is good for some purposes, but when you want to compute actual quantiles, like exact quantiles, then it it is true in general that the quintiles of a lighter tail distributions are going to be dominated by the are going to be dominated by the uh, let's say on the right tails are going to be dominated by those of a heavy distribution. Uh, that is true, but it's not always the case. And in particular, there's going to be some like sort of weird points where things are actually changing depending on what level you're actually looking at those things. Maybe five percent or ten percent in which case things might be changing a little bit. But if you start going really towards the tail, if you start looking at levels alpha, which are 1% or 0.1%, it is true that you're, it's always, if you can actually, so if you see something that looks light tail, you definitely do not want to conclude that it's Gaussian. You want to actually change your modeling so that you're, it makes your life even easier and, uh, and uh, you actually factor in the fact that you can see that the, the noise is actually more benign than you would like it to be. Okay. Stretching fingers, that's it, all right. Um, okay, so I want to, I mentioned at some point that uh, we had this uh, chi-square test that uh, was showing up and I do not know what I did. What's this, oh yeah. So, you know, we have this chi-square test that we, uh, we worked on uh, last time, right? So the way we, I introduced the chi-square test is by saying, I am fascinated by this question, let's check if it's correct, okay? or Let's, you know, something maybe slightly deeper. Let's check if juries in this country are representative of uh, 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 racial distribution. But uh, uh, you could actually, those numbers here come from like very specific thing. That was the uniform, that was our benchmark. Here's the uniform. And there was the, uh, this guy, which was a benchmark, which was, you know, the actual benchmark that we need to have for this problem. And those things basically came out of my hat, right? Those are numbers that exist. But in practice, you actually make those numbers yourself. And the way you do it is by saying, well, if I have a binomial distribution and I wanna test if my data comes from a binomial distribution, you could ask this question, right? You have a bunch of data. I did not promise to you that, you know, this was the sum of independent Bernoulli's and blah, and then you can actually check that it's a binomial indeed. And you have binomial, if you think about where you've encountered binomials, it was mostly when you were drawing balls from urns, which you probably don't do that much in practice, okay? And so maybe one day you wanna model things as a binomial, or maybe you wanna model it as a Poisson, as a limited binomial, right? People tell you, you know, photons arrive, the rate of photon hitting some surface is actually a Poisson distribution, right? That's where they arise a lot in imaging. Uh, right, so if I, you know, I have a, a, a colleague who's taking pictures of the skies overnight and is like following stars and it's just like moving around with the rotation of the earth and he has to do this for like, you know, eight hours because he needs to get enough photons for this picture to actually arise and they, he knows they arrive at, you know, Poisson, like a Poisson process and, you know, yeah, chapter seven of your probability class, I guess. And, uh, and you know, there's all these distributions that, you know, outside the classroom, you probably want to check that they're actually correct. And so the first one you might want to check, for example, is a, is a binomial. So I give you a distribution, a binomial distribution on, say, k trials, and you have some number p. 
And here, I don't know typically what P should be, but let's say I know it or I estimate it from my data. And here, since we're only going to do asymptotics, just like it was the case for the Kolmogorov Smirnov one in the asymptotic, we're going to be able to think of the uh, estimated P as being the true P, okay? Under the null, at least. So now for each outcome, I can actually tell you what the probability of a binomial is this outcome. For a given k and a given p, I can tell you exactly what a binomial should give you as a probability for the outcome. And that's what I actually use to replace the numbers, uh, you know, uh, uh, 1 over 12, 1 over 12, 1 over 12, 1 over 12, or the numbers uh, 0 0.72, 0 0.07, uh, 0 0.12, 0 0.09. All these numbers I can actually compute using the probabilities of a binomial, right? So I know, for example, that the probability that a binomial and p is equal to, say, k is, uh, and choose k, uh, p to the k, uh, 1 minus p to the n minus k, okay? And so these are numbers. If you give me p and you give me n, I can compute those numbers for all k from 0 to n. And from this, I can actually build a table. Right, so for each k, 0, so k is here, and uh, from 0, 1, etc., all the way to n, I can compute the true probability, which is the probability that my binomial np is equal to 0, the probability that my binomial is equal to 1, etc., all the way to n. I can compute those numbers. Those are actually going to be exact numbers, right? I just plug in. Uh, and the formula that I had. And then I'm going to have some observed. So that's going to be p hat 0, and that's basically the proportion of zeros. All right, so here you have to remember it's not a one time experiment like you do in probability where you say, oh, I'm going to draw. Uh, uh, n balls from an urn, and I'm counting how many how many I have. This is statistics. I need to be able to do this experiment many times so I can actually have, in the end, get an idea of what the proportion of p's is. So you have not just one binomial, but you have n binomials. Oh, maybe I should not use n uh, twice. So that's why it's a k here. Right, so I have a binomial k, k p, and I just see n of those guys. And with this n of those guys, I can actually estimate those probabilities. And what I'm going to want to check is if those two probabilities are actually close to each other. But I already know how to do this. All right, so here I'm going to test whether P is in some parametric family, for example, binomial or not binomials. And, uh, and uh, testing, if I know that it's a binomial ship, I basically just have to test if P is the right thing, OK? Oh, sorry, uh, I'm actually ch uh, uh, lying to you here. OK, I don't want to test if it's binomial. I want to test the, pr the, 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 the parameter of the binomial here. OK, so I know, right, so, no, sorry. That's, uh, sorry, that's, sorry. OK, so I want to know if I'm in some family, the family of binomials, or not in the family of binomials. OK, so that's what I want to do. And so here, H0 is basically equivalent to testing if the PJs are the PJs that come from the binomial. And the PJs here are the probabilities that my I get. This is the probability that I get uh, J uh, successes. Uh, that's my PJ. That's the Jth value here. OK, so this is the example. And we know how to do this. We construct P hat, which is the estimated proportion of successes from the observation. So here now I have n trials. This is the actual maximum likelihood estimator. This becomes a, a multinomial experiment. And uh, right, so it's kind of confusing. We have a multinomial experiment for binomial distribution. The binomial here is just a recipe to create some test probabilities. That's all it is. The binomial here doesn't really matter. It's really to, to create the test probabilities. And then I'm going to define this test statistic, which is known as the chi-square statistic, right? This was the chi-square test. We just looked at the sum of the square of the differences. In, uh, inverting the covariance matrix or using the Fisher information with removing the part that was not invertible led us to actually use this particular value here. And then we had to multiply by n. Okay? And that 
we know converges to what? A k-square distribution. So I'm not going to go through this again. I'm just telling you, you can use the k-square that we've seen where we, we just came up with the numbers we were testing, those numbers that were in this row for the true probabilities, we came up with them out of thin air. And now I'm telling you, you can actually come up with those guys from a binomial distribution or a Poisson distribution or whatever distribution you're happy with. Any question? So now I'm creating this thing and I can apply the entire theory that I had for the chi-square and in particular that this thing converges to a chi-square. But if you see there's something that's different, what is different? The degrees of freedom. And if you think about it, again, the meaning of degrees of freedom, what does this word in these words actually mean? It means, well, to which extent can I play around with those values? What are the possible values that I can get? If I'm not equal to this particular value I'm testing, in how many directions can I be different from this guy? And when we had like a given set of values, we could be any other set of values, right? So here I had this, I'm gonna represent, this is the set of all probability distributions of vectors of, a of size k. So here, if I look at one point in this set, this is something that looks like p1 to pk, such that uh, they're sum, so, such that they're non-negative, and the sum p1 to pk is equal to one. Okay, so I have all those points here. Okay, so this is basically the set that I had before. If I was testing whether I was equal to this one guy or if I was anything else. And there's many ways I can be anything else. What matters, of course, is what's around this guy that could I, I could actually confuse me myself with. But there's many ways I can move around this guy. Agreed? Now, I'm actually just testing something very specific. I'm saying, well, now the p's that I have have to come from this, have to be constructed from this uh, formula, this parametric family, p of theta. And there's a very, you know, there's a fixed way for, let's say this is theta, so I have a theta here. There's not that many ways this can actually give me a set of probabilities, right? I can, I have to move to another theta to actually start being confused. And so here, the number of degrees of freedom is basically how can I move along this family? And so here, this is all the points, but there might be just the subset of the points that looks like this, just this curve, not uh, a half, uh, half of the thing. And those guys on this curves are the p thetas. And that's for all thetas when theta runs across theta. So in a way, this is just a much smaller dimensional thing. It's a much smaller object. Those are the only the ones that I can create that are exactly of this very specific parametric form. And not, of course, not all are of this form. Not all probability PMFs are of this form. And so that is going to have an effect on what my uh, PMF is going to be. On, sorry, on what my um, my uh, um, uh, sorry, what my um, uh, degrees of freedoms are going to be. Because when this thing is very small, right? That means when that's happening when theta is actually say a one-dimensional space, then there's still many ways I can escape. Right? I can be different from this guy in pretty much every other direction except for those two directions. Just when I move from here or when I move in this direction. But now if this thing becomes bigger, here theta is say two dimensional, then when I'm here, it's becoming harder for me to not be that guy. If I want to move away from it, I have to move away from the board. And so that means that the bigger the dimension of my, uh, of my theta, the smaller the degrees of freedoms that I have, okay? Because moving out of this parametric family is actually very difficult for me. So if you think, for example, as, the, as an extreme case, the parametric family that I have is basically all uh, uh, PMFs, all of them, right? So that's a stupid parametric family. I'm indexed by the distribution itself, but it's still finite dimensional then here I have basically no degrees of freedom. There's no way I can actually not be that guy because this is everything I have. And so 
you don't have to really understand what the com how the computation comes in into uh, into a numbers of, of dimension and what I mean by dimension of this curved space. But really, what's important is that as the dimension of theta becomes bigger, I have less degrees of freedom to become to be away from this family. This family becomes big, and it's very hard for me to violate this. So it's actually shrinking the number of degrees of freedom of my uh, of my k-square. And that's all you need to understand. When d increases, the number of degrees of freedom decreases. And if you, I, I'd like to, you to have an idea of why this is somewhat true, and this is basically the picture you should have in mind. OK, so now once I have done this, I can just construct. So here, I need to check. So what is d in the case of the binomial? 1, right? It's just a one-dimensional thing. And for most of the examples we're going to have, it's going to be one-dimensional. So we have this weird thing where we're going to have k minus 2 degrees of freedom. So uh, now I have this thing, and, uh, and uh, I have this uh, asymptotic. Uh, and then I can just basically use a test that, has, that uses the fact that the asymptotic distribution is this. So I compute my quintiles out of this. Again, I made the same mistake. This should be q alpha, and this should be q alpha. Uh, so that's just the tail probability is equal to alpha when I'm on the right uh, of q alpha. And so those are the tail probability of the appropriate chi-square with the appropriate number of degrees of freedom. And so I can compute p-values, and I can do whatever I want. OK, so then I just like unfold my testing machinery. OK, so now I know how to test a, if I'm um, a binomial distribution or not. Again, here, I, testing if I'm a binomial distribution is not a, a simple goodness of fit. It's a composite one where I can actually, there's many ways I can be a binomial distribution because there's as many as there is theta. And so I'm actually plugging in the theta hat, which is estimated uh, from the data, right? And here, since everything's happening in the asymptotics, I'm not claiming that Tn has a pivotal distribution for finite n. It's actually not true. It's going to depend like crazy on what the actual distribution is. But asymptotically, I have a chi-square, which obviously does not depend on anything I've done. OK? Yeah. That's correct. And uh, thank you for this beautiful segue into my next slide. Uh, so we can actually deal with the case not only where it's infinite, which would be the case of Poisson. I mean, nobody believes I'm going to get an infinite number of, of photons in a finite amount of time. But we just don't want to have to say there's going to be a large, th this is the largest possible number. We don't want to have to do that, because if you start doing this, then the probabilities become uh, close to 0, things become degenerate, and it's an issue. So what we do is we bin. We just bin stuff, OK? And so maybe, you know, if I have a binomial distribution with, say, 200,000 uh, uh, possible values, then it's actually maybe not the level of, uh, of uh, uh, precision I want to look at this. Maybe I want to bin. Maybe I want to say, let's just think of all things that are between 0 and 100 to be the same thing, between 100 and, and 200 the same thing, et cetera. And so if I act I'm actually going to bin, I don't even have to think about things that are discrete. I can even think about continuous cases. And so if I want to test if I have a Gaussian distribution, for example, I can just approximate that by some, say, piecewise constant function that just says that, well, you know, if I have a Gaussian distribution like this, I'm going to bin it like this. And I'm going to say, well, the probability that I'm less than this value is this. The probability that I'm between this and this value is this. The probability that I'm between this and this value is this. And then this, and then this, right? And now I've turned, I've discretized effectively my Gaussian into a PMF. The value, th this is P1. The value here is P1. This is P2. This is P3. This is P4. This is P5 and p6, right? I've discretized my Gaussian into six possible values. That's just the probability that they fall into a certain bin. And we can do this. If you, if you don't know what k is, just stop at 10. 
you know, let's look, you look at your data quickly and you say, well, you know, I have so few of them that are like, I, I see maybe one uh, eight, one 11 and one 15. Well, everything that's between eight and 20, I'm just gonna put in one bin. Because what else are you gonna do? I mean, you just don't have enough observation. And so what we do is we just bin everything. So here I'm gonna actually be slightly abstract. Our bins are gonna be intervals, AJ. So here, they don't even have to be intervals. I could go crazy and just like call the bin this guy and this guy, right? That would make no sense, but uh, I could do that. And, uh, and then I'm, and of course, you know, you can do whatever you want, but th there's gonna be some consequences on the conclusions that you can take, right? All you're gonna be able to say is that my distribution does not look like it could be binned in this way. That's all you're gonna be able to say. So if you decide to just put all the negative numbers and the positive numbers, then it's gonna be very hard for you to distinguish a Gaussian from a random variable that takes values minus one and plus one only. You need to just, you know, be reasonable. Okay, so now I have my PJs become the probability that my random variable falls into bin J. Um, so that's PG of theta under the parametric distribution. For the true one, whether it's parametric or not, I have a PJ. And then I have a P hat J, which is the proportion of observations that falls in this bin. All right, so I have a bunch of observations. I count how many of them fall in this bin. I divide by N and that tells me what my estimated probability for this bin is. And theta hat, well, it's the same as before. If I'm in a parametric family, I'm just estimating theta hat, maybe a maximum likelihood estimator, plug it in and estimate those PG of theta hat. From this, I form my k-square, and uh, I have exactly the same thing as before. So the answer to your question is, yes, you bin. And uh, it's the answer to even more questions. So that's why there you can actually use the k-square test to test for normality. Now here, it's gonna be slightly weaker because there's only an asymptotic theory, whereas kolmogorov smirnov and kolmogorov lili force work actually even for finite samples for for the k-squared test, it's only asymptotic. So you just pretend you actually know what the parameters are, you just stuff them into uh, a, a theta a mu hat and sigma square hat, and uh, you just go to, you just cross your finger that n is large enough for everything to have converged by the time you make your decision. Okay, and then this is a copy paste with the same error actually, uh, as the previous slide where you just uh, build your test based on whether you exceed or not some quintile and uh, you can also compute some p-value. Okay? I'm sorry? What is the error? Oh, the error is that uh, this should be q-alpha, right? Okay. I've been calling this q-alpha. I mean, the, that's my personal uh, choice because I don't want to, I only use q-alpha, so I only use quantiles of degree where alpha is to the right, so that's what statisticians, probably would use this, uh, this notation. Okay, and so uh, some questions, right? So of course, in practice, you're gonna have some issues which, you know, translate, I said, well, how do you pick this guy, this K? So I gave you some sort of, uh, you know, I mean, the way we discussed, right? You have eight and 10 and 20, then it's, you know, it's ad hoc. And uh, so depending on whether you wanna stop K at 20 or if you wanna bin those guys, is really up to you. And there's gonna be some considerations about the particular problem at hand. I mean, is it coarse, too coarse for your problem to decide that, the observations between eight and 20 are the same, it's really up to you. Maybe that's actually making a huge difference in terms of what phenomenon you're looking at. Uh, the choice of the bins, right? So here there's actually some sort of rules which are don't use only one bin and uh, don't make sure there's actually at least, don't use them too small so that there's at least one observation per bin, right? And it's basically the same kind of rules that you would have to build a histogram. If you were to build a histogram for your data, you still wanna make sure that you bin in an appropriate fashion. Okay, and there's a bunch of rule of thumbs. Um, every time you ask someone, they're gonna have a different rule of thumb, so, you know, just make your own. And, uh, and uh, then there's the computation of P, uh, G of theta, which might be a bit complicated because in this case, I would have to integrate the Gaussian between this number and this number. So for this case, I could just say, well, it's difference of the CDF in that value and that value, and then be happy with it. But you can imagine that you have some slightly more crazy distributions, you're gonna have to somewhat compute some integrals that might be unpleasant for you to compute, okay? And in particular, I said the difference of the PDF between that value and that value, uh, sorry, the CDF between that value and that value, it is true, 
but it's not like you actually have tables that compute the CDF at any value you like, right? You have to sort of, you know, well, there might be, but at some, some degree, but you are gonna have to use a computer typically to do that. Okay, and uh, so for example, you could do the Poisson. Uh, if I had time, if I had more than one minute, I would actually do it for you, but uh, it's basically the same, the Poisson, you're gonna have an infinite tail, and you just say, at some point, I'm gonna cut everything that's larger than some value. All right, so uh, you can play around for some, right? I say, well, if you have extra knowledge about what you expect to see, maybe you can cut at a certain number and then just fold all the largest values from k minus one to infinity uh, so that uh, you actually have, um, you have everything into one large bin, okay? That's the entire tail. And that's the way people do it in insurance companies, for example. They assume that the number of accidents you're gonna have is a Poisson distribution. They have to fit it to you. They have to know, or at least to your pool of insurance, of insured people. So they just, you know, slice you into, you know, what your character, relevant characteristics are. And then they want to estimate what the Poisson distribution is. And basically they, they, do a, they can do a chi-square test to check if it's indeed a Poisson distribution. All right, so uh, that will be it for today. And uh, so I'll be, I'll have your homework.